Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to this webinar session that uh, we will be conducting on the proposed e-waste management rules of India. We will be going through the key highlights of the proposed rules, uh, EPR framework, responsibilities of various stakeholders, the EPR certificate generation, and modalities of EPR regime and the environmental compensation. Today, as you all know that we celebrate the International E-Waste Day. Uh, the day was developed in 2018 by the V Forum, an international association of e-waste collection schemes with the support of its members to promote the correct disposal of e-waste throughout the world with the aim to increase reuse, recovery and recycling. This year, we are at its, at its fifth edition and uh, yes, we are here with the awareness session and uh, yes, we will be taking you through the through the draft e-waste management rules. Uh, there are certain rules towards uh, today's webinar. Please note that the meeting is recorded. All the attendees uh, are on mute. If you have any queries, you may raise your hand and the moderator shall unmute you and you may uh, take up your question. Please make sure that you introduce yourself and your organization. We will take the Q&A session towards the end of the PPT and yes, thereafter we can uh, have a good discussion. Um, yes, today's speaker is Mr. Abhishek Garg. Over to you, Mr. Abhishek. Thank you, Ipshita, and thank you for setting up the context. And yes, I welcome every one of you on this fifth International E-Ways Day. And thanks a lot for everyone to take out time to, you know, understand the proposed e-waste management rules on this occasion of fifth International E-Ways Day. So, so let's quickly start and let's delve upon the IDRA proposed, what it holds for us, what how we are impacted, and what the critical things which we need to be ensuring or knowing about the proposed e-waste management rules. Before we start with the proposed e-waste management rules, a quick update that uh, the final um, uh, e-waste uh, management rules is up to come anytime soon, maybe in this October month, or maybe very soon as they have already delayed the timelines. But yes, it's up and uh, it's going to be uh, available anytime soon. So yeah, to so with that note, let's start. So yes, the e-waste rules before getting into the draft, the proposed e-waste management rules, the first e-waste management and handle rules were uh, you know published by MOFCC in 2011. Subsequent to that, the e-waste management rule 2016 was introduced, which is currently active. And it's being uh, being followed by most of the companies. And then there was in 2018, there was slight amendment under the e-waste management rules, talking about the overall implementation of the EPR. And then today we are, as we are discussing this e-waste management, proposed e-waste management rules, which was uh, you know released by CPCB on 19 March 2022. Further, now what is the structure? What what are the what is the rule hold or what is the structure of the whole rule? So yes, so the rules hold there are around seven chapters. There are around 32 rules covered under seven, seven chapters and there are three schedules attached to this rule. So what are the chapters talks about? The first, the seven chapter, the chapter one talks about the preliminary details about short title and commencement, applicability of the rule in India and also the clarity in definitions. Chapter two talks about the EPR framework. Chapter three, lays down the responsibilities of the obligation entities of the statutory bodies and also of the state governments, port authorities and BIS. Chapter four is very brief, talks about the storage of e-waste. Chapter five, it talks about the modalities of the EPR regime with the state system of how the certificate will be generated, uh, how the transaction of EPR certificates would happen and how the calculation and there's a formula is also given how the certificate quantity of cert recycling would be calculated. Chapter six talks about ROHS, which is reduction of hazardous substances in the products. And chapter seven is all about miscellaneous. There are about how who will be issuing the guidelines. It talks about what would the annual reporting, what would be about transportation of e-waste, accident reporting, environmental compensation, and there on. Then they are subsequent to this, there are uh, subsequent to the chapters. There are schedules which are attached with this proposed rules. The first schedule one, which talks about the list, 
uh, of the items of triple e which will be obligated for the under the epr so it's a it's a big uh, <coughs> change or a big amendment although in the in the upcoming rule as versus uh, uh, you know 21 items in the last rules of e waste management rule 2016 now there are around 96 items in totality which will be obligated under the EPR, under the e-waste management rules. And there are six categories in totality. Previously, there was only two categories. How Now there are six. So yes, we'll go take you through that as well. Schedule 2 talks about applications which are exempted from the requirements of EPR. And Schedule 3 it gives us the target by slab by target which needs to be implemented year on. And Schedule 3A, which talks about year-wise uh, slab of e-waste recycling target for the new producers who company who has recently started their operations in the electronics and which will be turning out to be waste after a specified period of time. Moving on. What are the key highlights of this proposed rule? So yeah, as I already told you that in the schedule one, there are around 96 equipments and there are around 75 new items which are available under this. Yeah. Then in the new EPR target slab, which is proposed by CPC, MOEFCC, from FY 2023, the target will start from 60% FY 2223, and it will reach to 80% by 2425. Further, CPCB is going to come out with an online portal, which will facilitate the entire compliance from start to end, which will talk about registration, annual reporting filing or quarterly report filing, issuance of EPR certificate through recyclers, all those things will be taken to uh, care through by the online centralized EPR portal. And yes, that is what is also happening in the uh, in, in, in the other EPR regime, like for example, plastics and others. Further, in the pre-consumer waste or what we call it industrial waste during the processes, the industrial e-waste. So e-waste generated during the process of manufacturing, recycling, refurbishing is also covered under the obligation. Further, EPR certificate, which will be issued by the recycler, will be valid for a period of two years from the end of the FI in which it is released for the next two FIs. Yeah. EPR obligation from the refurbishing certificate would be deferred by the duration as prescribed by the CPCB. So if, if there is a refurbishing certificate which has been taken or for the quantity, there is a refurbishment has been done, the certificate can be used for deferring those quantities liability for the, the life for which it has been extended. We'll discuss that in the upcoming slides. Doing business without registration and dealing with entities who are not registered are not allowed. Further, entities who have who are falling in multiple obligation, let's say they are producer also or manufacturer also, they have to register separately under both the obligations. The bulk consumer definition has been defined here and there's a massive change here in which bulk consumer defined as any entity which uses at least 1000 uh, AEEE item listed in schedule one in a particular F, in a particular time in a previous FI. The concept of producer responsibility organization, which which was a very important entity and a stakeholder, is now been removed from the proposed rules, and dismantle is also not required to procure a separate registr registration. As I said, there is a quarterly and annual filing which will be required in the, the new e-waste management rules, the proposed e-waste man management rules. And CPCB will be also laying down the clear environmental guidelines for for actions on the violation of the uh, on the rules which are be uh, you know put forward into the draft. And yes, CPCB shall charge registration fees and annual maintenance charges for the registrations. Now, before getting into the rules, uh, let's let's just some uh, quickly look through what are the items which has came in and what are the could count of items which are being uh, included into schedule one for which companies will be obligated for uh, under EPR. So there are six categories. The first category is information technology and telecommunication equipment in which under the old rules, there were 16 items which was defined. Now under the new rules, uh, the proposed new rule, there are totality 25 items has been you know listed down. Hence, there is an incremental nine items which has been added in, in the category one. In the category two, which is the consumer electrical and electronics and photovoltaic panels, in which the older rule, the 2016 rule counted only five items. In the new rule, there are around 18 items which has been listed, incremental being 13. 
and subsequent to that the four new categories are been added and there are counts of material you can see here which are been listed down in those categories for example large and small electrical and electronic equipment there are 29 items electrical and electronic tool there are eight items toys legion and sports equipment there are six items and yes medical devices there are around 10 items in totality uh, if you look uh, older rule versus new rule 21 items was there in the old rule across two categories now there are 96 items across six categories hence incremental items which are included in the schedule one is 75 so yes there will be a lot of industries which will be impacted under the same a lot of companies will have to come through and they have to comply with the epr moving forward <laughs> now let's look forward to what who are the critical stakeholders what are their applicabilities so you can see there are five uh, critical stakeholders which has been defined listed on in this slide out of which four are very critical in terms of the whole operation and compliance is under the e-waste first and foremost is manufacturer yes and who are manufacturers entity under the, uh, the registered under the companies act factories or, or the factories under the factories act or small and medium enterprises under the msme development act who has facilities for manufacture of triple equipment as per schedule one so any entity who is manufacturing and who is registered in subsequent uh, uh, under the rule who's uh, uh, producing any uh, triple e listed equipments or components or spare parts are to be termed as manufacturer now very critical to understand is the definition and the applicability of who will be falling under as obligated producer so who is a producer an entity irrespective of the selling techniques such as retailer dealer e-retailer a producer is an entity who manufactures and sells the triple e equipments components spare parts under its own brand name second offer it to sell under its own brand name assemble the assembled triple e equipment component spare parts so first is if a company is manufacturing any of the equipment listed in schedule one or their component or spare parts and sell it in the market with their brand name they are to be referred as a producer and yes they will be manufactured also further if an entity offers to sell an equipment listed in cell, uh, schedule one or their components parts or spare parts under its own brand name but it is produced by another manufacturer or, or they have procured from other suppliers then the company who is selling under its own brand name will be uh, will be treated obligated as a producer third offers to sell imported triple e equipment or component or consumables they will be termed as producer or the fourth one who imports used uh, equipments or schedule one listed equipments so in these four cases an, uh, an entity irrespective of their selling techniques uh, if he's manufacturing and selling under its own brand name he will be treated as a producer and he has to take the obligation and fulfill the obligation if he's selling not manufacturing but procuring from other manufacturing suppliers yes he will be treated as producer Third is offers to sell the imported products. Yes, he will be treated as a import uh, producer and who imports used triple E equipment. Yes, they will be treated as a uh, producer. So one of the key thing to notice here is the company who is introducing the product, the triple E equipment products listed on schedule one will be one focal point for uh, fulfilling the EPR obligation. Moving on, refurbisher. So the, who is refurbisher? The entity repairing used triple e uh, equipment listed in schedule one for extending its uh, working life over its originally intended life for the same use as originally intended and selling the same in the market so basically a refurbisher will be treated as a, uh, coming under the definition of refurbisher if he is refurbishing a particular equipment uh, and extending its uh, useful life beyond a uh, defined useful life and it is used for the same intended use so let's take an example of a mobile phone if a smartphone if he is refurbishing it which increases its, its useful life and it is used for the same purpose and it sell, sell it into the market then he will be called as a refurbisher who is a recycler then 
so any person who recycles or or reprocesses the equipment or assembles or their component or their parts for recovery of precious semi precious metals including rare earth elements and other recoverable materials to strengthen the secondary source material having facilities as elaborated in guidelines by cpcb so a recycle is a is an entity who is uh, who is uh, you know uh, recovering the precious metals out of the this used equipments or e waste and uh, which includes rare precious metals semi precious metals and rare earth elements then fin finally who is a bulk consumer we discussed that any entity uh, which has used at least 1000 triple e equipments list, uh, equipment list in schedule 1 at any point of time in the particular financial year including e retailer and they are not covered under the epr hence under registration is not applicable to the bulk consumer as already highlighted under the in the key highlights you the entities which are highlighted here which is manufacturer producer refurbisher and recycler they cannot carry out business without registration and cannot do business with the each other without registration very clearly the final exception here is the batteries are not covered under the e-waste because for batteries there is a separate ea rule which was released uh, recently uh, for packaging plastic packaging there is a separate pw which is governed by this and for micro enterprises of service sector which are under the as per the msc development act are exempted exception to this uh, e, e, e waste management rules and for the items con co containing radioactive waste are not covered under the e waste management rules they are covered under separate rules so these are the exceptions to the e waste management rules moving forward so what is chapter 2 talking about is about the epr framework so as we spoke registration is very important for all these four entities they have to register on the online portal Second, if an entity provides false or concealed information for getting registration or for filing returns or uh, or any information required to be provided under the rules, and there are any false and information which are concealed, then in such a if that is found and proven, registration of such entity will be revoked by CPCB for for up to three years after giving an opportunity to being heard. Additionally, they can also charge environmental compensation on the same as already spoken and i'm repeating it again and again because that's very important that entities covered under producer as well as manufacturer must register in both the categories cpcb may charge a registration and annual maintenance fee that we discussed and yeah with the draft proposed rule they are yet to issue the technical guidelines cpcb the the final amendment and the forms for registration procedure which is yet to be received or yet to be issued by the CPCB. Further, this is a one page which talk about the responsibilities of the key stakeholders, which is a chapter three governed by the chapter three. So basically, if you look forward, these are the four important stakeholder under the defined under the rule, which is manufacturer, producer, refurbisher, and recycler. And to provide clarity to the general public that what is the responsibility of bulk consumer, this has been also included to clarify the doubts. So, for example, who are supposed to get registered? Yes, the top first four needs to get registered. Bulk consumer, no. EPR target assigned as per Schedule 2, it is only for producer, not for the uh, other. But however, the manufacturer has to ensure the pre-consumer or the uh, e-waste generated during the manufacturing cycle. But that's not counted under the EPR for the producer, uh, manufacturer. They have to who has to file the QPR and e, uh, annual return. This is manufacturer, producer, refurbisher, and recycler. Who can issue EPR certificates? It is recycler. Who needs to create awareness through multiple media? It is producers and uh, producers and recyclers. The ROHS compliance falls under whose responsibility? It is manufacturer, producer. They has to comply with the ROHS uh, compliances. Industrial e-waste generated during manufacturing, refurbishing, recycling is sent is, needs to be sent to the respective registered recycler. That is the requirement that needs to be followed by all, which is manufacturer, producer, refurbisher, and recycler. Ensure residue generated from recycling recycling process process is sent to CHWTSDF is of recycler. 
maintaining records of e-waste collected <laughs> dismantled recycled and sent to register recycler on the online portal is the responsibility of refurbish and a recycler and who may accept the e-waste apart from schedule one the e any e-waste which is not listed in the schedule one can a recycler accept yes it is it is the responsibility of the recycler and who can collect and send e-waste generated to re registered recycler it is the responsibility to everyone including bulk consumer so for bulk consumer it is important to collect and uh, to ensure the e-waste is collected and sent to registered recycler that is his obligation further Refurbishing shall be done in accordance with the compulsory registration scheme of METI and BIS. Recyclers shall maintain their facility in accordance with the CPCB guidelines. And recyclers shall be accountable for and for and upload information about non-recyclable, not recycled e-waste which is disposed of in a secured landfills. So yes, these are the responsibilities which we have tried to cover it in one page to uh, you know uh, review any any ambiguity for the. Uh, information receiver. Yeah. Moving forward. What are the responsibilities of producer? Now we are under an, another. We have kind of summarized the responsibility of producer being a very key stakeholder. So yes, uh, again, coming back to the same thing, there might be some repetitions, but that is important to understand. So for responsibility of producer, yes, registration on the online portal is very much the responsibility of the producer. Obtain and implement the APR target as per schedule three through CPCB online portal. And the schedule three is defined here in which the first year target slab is 60%, which is FY2223, going to 80% by 2425. Producers registered under EWM rule 2016 shall have to migrate under the new rules as per the as per the procedure near to be laid down by CPCB. So the uh, producers who were registered under the EWM rule in 2016 need to migrate to the new rules and on get registered on the online portal. The procedure will is yet to come from CPCB. Further, <laughs> the producer need to create awareness through media, publication, advertisement, posters, or any other means. And they need to file QPR, annual return, as the prescribed format and CPCB on or before the end of the succeeding month of the quarter or the year to which the re return relates. So, excuse me. So, for example, if my quarter is ending on December, I have to file my QPR by by January. If my annual annual year is financially is ending on 30, uh, 31st March, I need to file my annual return by by 30th April. So that is how they have given. But I think these will be further uh, clarified in the uh, final guidelines and the final rule and the guidelines to which is yet to be issued by CPCB. Uh, further, as we spoke again and again, that is being repeated that we need, uh, the entity is falling under multiple obligations. They have to register separately and they cannot do business without registration and you cannot do business with any entity who is not registered. Now, how the EPR obligation of the producer will be decided. So the EPR obligation for each product under each category for the producer will be decided on the basis of information provided by the producer in the form which will be and will be dependent on the product's life cycle as prescribed by the CPCB for which the guideline is yet to come and the rates prescribed in schedule three. So if we take if we take little, uh, you know, uh, reference from the older rule in which uh, CPCB had clearly defined what is the end of life, what is the useful life of the cat, uh, equipments which are listed in schedule one, which forms the basis of the total quantity of the EPR targets. So the similar logic would be applied in which the producers has to give how much quantity they have sold in the prior years, which will be turned out to be waste after their end of useful life and ultimately applying the, the rates prescribed in schedule to arrive at this EPR target. How the fulfillment of those targets will be considered? Now here there is a massive change which we are looking after as a total EPR ambit, not only in e-waste, wherein everything for a fulfillment of EPR. Obtaining online purchase of EPR certificate from the registered recycler will only be considered for towards your EPR fulfillment. And subsequently that needs to submit to the online portal as your annual return or your QPR. So yes, now the whole modalities and the 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 <laughs> the operations will now move towards procuring the uh, the online EPR certificate through the recyclers and the certificate generation, the formula, the rules, 
those are little bit provided in the upcoming slide but the more important thing is the the how the uh, targets will be calculated basis your sales and basis the end of life a useful life of the uh, equipment and how the fulfillment be considered if you have online certificate issued by registered recycle on your name and you have which you have procured can be only be used against fulfillment your of your epi target the details provided by the producer registered registered recyclers online like for example this is recycler said the 100 ton of uh, uh, itw20 uh, itw5 has been uh, done by recycler a and they, he has given 100 tons of credit if he has on the favor of producer b uh, then the quantities will be matched and cross synced in case the quantities are not matching there is a difference uh, the lower figure would be considered toward the fulfillment of EPR obligation of the producer. The certificate shall be subject to environment and audit by the agencies authorized by CPCB and the importers of used electrical and electrical equipment will have 100% EPR obligation for the import imported material after the end of life if not re-exported. <clears throat> so if any company is importing uh, electronics, they will be having a 100% EPR target and if it's not re-exported, if it is re-exported, then I think there they will not be any target. However, if it's not re-exported, uh, this uh, will be excluded from 100% target. Moving on. Now, this is about the certificate generation for recycle and a refurbisher. Now, CPCB for the recycling, CPCB shall generate EPR certificate through the portal in favor of the registered recycler in the format as prescribed. So uh, what is going to happen is that recycler will have to follow a little process in terms of they need to provide details of procurement of uh, electronic waste, uh, recycling process and ultimately sell who are they selling those recycling products to. On the basis of these important data which they need to put into the portal, online portal where they will be registered, the CPCB will be issuing EPR certificate through the portal on the favor of the recycler. And this recycler need to sell or the producer need to buy this certificates from the recycler or they need to issue it on the uh, recycler need to issue it on the favor of the producer. How the eligible quantity for generation of EPR certificate will be calculated is by through using the formula which is given by the CPCB. The quantity of EPR certificate will be equal to the quantity of end product and the conversion factor. So there will be a quantity and there will be a conversion factor and conversion factor for each product will be prescribed by CPCB with the approval of the steering committee. So the conversion factor is not yet given for each product. The end of life disposal, end of life of product is not given. These are yet to be issued, but they have given you the uh, how the calculation and quantity will be done uh, uh, for issuing the certificate. Further, the EPR certificate which is issued by CPCB on the online portal will be valid for a period of two years from the end of the financial year for which it was generated. So, for example, let's say a recycler has issued a 100 ton EPR certificate in December 2022. Then this EPR certificate will be valid till uh, 31st March 2025. So it says EPR certificate will be valid from the end for two years from end of the financial year. For example, if they are issuing a 100 ton certificate, the end of financial year it would be 31st March 2023. It was generated. So hence the two years from the end of the financial year, year is uh, the 20, 31st March 2025. So hence the certificate will be valid till 31st March 2025. If this those certificates are not expired or not automatically extinguished. When I say expired or extinguished means so let's say that 100 tons of certificate issued on favor of recycler is being used or purchased by producer and producer has used that or used that 100 tons to set off its target obligation then that 100 tons of EPR certificate is termed to be extinguished. It is not valid for next two years. That is what they meant to say. Further, the EPR certificate which will be generated will have a unique code and the unique code, code will be created by combining the year of generation, the code of end product, recycler code and a unique code. 
the re EPS certificate will be in the denomination of 100, 500, 200, 500 or 1000 kgs as may be prescribed by CPCB after the approval of the steering committee. Going ahead about refurbishment. So e-waste would also be allowed for allowed for refurbishing. Yeah, A refurbishing certificate shall be generated in favor of the registered refurbisher. Yes, as we already know, they are issuing in the favor of recycler for refurbisher. CPC will be our online portal on the online portal. The refurbishing certificate will be issued on the favor of uh, refurbisher based on the data provided. And what are those data? The uh, collections, the recycling and the selling of the recycled product. The EPR obligation from the refurbishing certificates would be deferred by the duration as prescribed by the CPCB for the corresponding quantity. So let's take an example for this. So refurbishing certificate is not going to set off your target fulfillment of your EPR target. Let's say you have a thousand ton of EPR target and you have gathered uh, you know, uh, 800 tons of recycling. So that will fulfill your 800 tons of target fulfillment. For the 200 tons, you have gathered refurbishing certificate. That is not going to fully close your 200 tons EPR obligation. What is going to do? It is going to defer the 200 tons EPR target of those 200 tons for that year to further years as prescribed by CPCB. So refurbishing, if you are getting refurbishing, it means you are just deferring your target because you are refurbished the products. And that is what it talks about. It's not going to, uh, you know, set off your EPR target. It's just going to defer your EPR target. EPR obligation will be extinguished only after EPR certificate is generated for end of life disposal through registered recycler and not by refurbishing certificate. This is what I just spoke about. Moving on. Now about they have also spoken about transaction of EPR certificates. So what is the eligibility and what is the capacity of purchasing the EPR certificates for the producers? So producer can purchase the EPR certificate in a year limited to a certain quantity. What is that quantity eligibility is? It's EPR liability for the current year. Let's say the EPR liability is 2000 tons. So they can buy 2000 tons of EPR certificate plus if there is a leftover liability of five preceding years, let's say there is a leftover liability of 500 tons. So they can buy 2000 tons uh, of worth of certificate for the, because of the liability of this year, 500 tons of the previous years, preceding years and 10% of the current year liability. So the current year liability is 200 tons, uh, 2000 tons. So 10% of it is 200 tons. So in a year uh, for this year, particularly uh, the producer can buy the EPR certificates up to a quantity of 2,700 tons in which 2,000 is the current year liability, uh, leftover is 500 tons and 10% of the current year liability is 200 tons, totally, totaling to 2,700 tons. What are the rules and the uh, rules defined for the transaction of EPR certificate for a producer? Purchase of an EPR certificate will automatically adjust, adjust against the producer's responsibility and priority in adjustment will be given towards the earlier liability. So let's say uh, for the 2000 tons of my uh, EPR target for this year, uh, the producers have procured 2000 tons of recycling certificate. It will, if once it purchases online those certificate that producer, it will automatically adjust the 2000 tons liability for the current year for the producers. However, it will give priority for the earlier year obligation. So what will happen? Let's say 500 tons is my earlier obligation. The 2000 tons of certificate which I have, you know, we have procured uh, 500 tons will be first set off from the previous preceding years obligation and then 1500 tons of this year obligation will be set off. So you will be still left with for fulfilling for 500 tons for the current year in this mechanism. EPRs. EPR set uh, liability will be deferred automatically on purchase of refurbishing certificate for the relevant quantity of the product for the duration as prescribed by CPCB. We spoke about that as well. The availability requirement and other details of EPR certificate and refurbishing certificates for every producer, recycler, refurbisher will be made available on the portal. And all transactions shall be recorded and submitted quarterly. Moving on. So there is a small brief about how the storage of e-waste should be done in chapter 4. So the e, triple E can be stored by, manu, by a manufacturer, producer, refurbisher and recycler. 
period of storage cannot ex must not exceed above 120 days, six months. Record of sale, transfer, and storage uh, of e-waste must be readily available for inspections. Storage of e-waste must be done as per the relevant rules and guidelines, which is yet to come. And CPCB may extend the period of 365 days in case of special storage requirement, such as development of a process for its recycling purpose. So that depends on the requirement basis. Moving on, again coming back to the responsibilities as uh, there's the responsibilities of uh, CPCB is also defined. So the in the responsibilities of CPCB, what is the responsibility of CPCB is operation and maintenance of EPR portal and monitoring of EPR compliance, coordinating with the SPCBs, prepare guidelines and SOPs for implementation of the governing and implementation of the governing regulation and environmentally sound management of e-waste, Conduct random checks for ascertaining uh, compliances of e-waste rules may take help of customs, state government, or any other agencies. Documentation and compilation of data on e-waste and uploading the same in the website of CPCB. Action against the violation of these rules, conducting training programs, conducting e awareness, integrating all stakeholders on the centralized portal. Submit annual report to the ministry. Enforcement of the provision regarding ROHS compliances, interaction with the IT industry, set and revise targets for the compliance of ROHS, ensure ROHS compliance and its certification through recognized lab, and any other function as delegated by ministry under this rule from time to time. <laughs> There's more responsibilities has been defined for state pollution control boards and the pollution control committees of these respective states and union territories. State governments, urban local bodies, rural panchayats, port authorities under Indian ports, and custom authority under, under the Customs Act and the BIS and METI. You can refer and go through in detail, would be moving ahead quickly in the essence of the time. Further, there are certain miscellaneous guide, uh, rules also been given under the chapter 7. So firstly, registration, which I have been speaking again and again that no registration, no entity shall carry out business without registration. Guidelines. So for, uh, for the entire set of guidelines are to be issued by CPCB after the approval from the MOFCC. Annual report CPCB to MOFCC and annual report explaining the status of implementation of the e-waste management rules need to be submitted by CPCB to MOFCC. Transportation of e-waste also should be done in a proper manner. For example, the manufacturer recycler should transport the waste destined for final disposal to a TSDF following the provision under the hazardous waste management rules, which also talks about uh, the the uh, <clears throat> these set of forms need to be filed. Then about the accidental reporting, the appeals, the prosecution and the validation and audit. So uh, that those are the rules which has been defined under chapter seven. So for example, accident reporting an accident, an accident at an e-waste processing facility or during transportation should shall be reported immediately to the concerned SPCB. For the appeal, any person within 30 days to an aggrieved order for suspension, cancellation, refusal of registration, renewal issued by CP in a prescribed form for to, uh, to the central government. The appellate authority may entertain the appeal after the expiry of the said period of 30 days if it is satisfied that the appellant was prevented by sufficient cause from filing the appeal in time. Prosecution. Prosecution will be under section 15 of the EPA, which also talks about the imprisonment. Prosecution will be addition in addition to the EC levied under the rule 28 of the regulation. Conditions of prosecutions are provide provides incorrect information, false or forged EPR certificates, violates the directions, and fails to cooperate in the verification and audit proceedings. So prosecution will be conducted in such conditions, the prosecution will be taken forward. Validation and audit. <laughs> CPCB will be ver verifying the compliance of producers, manufacturers, refurbishers, and recyclers. Verification will be via random inspection and periodic audits. And action against violations shall be as per EC under Rule 28. Now, very important about the environmental compensation. So 
what they have said about the environmental companies a detailed guideline about how this will be imposed and what rule what are the and just to give you a uh, feeler about the ec they recently ecpcb has released the environmental compensation guidelines under the pwm rules and we are expecting a lot of inspiration and a learning would be taken from that to implement under the e waste as well so uh, you can refer to the link and if that you can give the youtube link for the ec of pwm so people can take a reference from that however coming back to the e waste so imposition and collection so any entity in case of violation of any provisions of this regulation and guideline issued under these rules so cpcb is yet to issue the guidelines but the environmental composition and imposition will be done on what on which kind of entity so any entity who is violating any rules which are pro provided under the the final rules producer who are not fulfilling the obligations set out in the set out and transaction or use of false epr certificate to fulfill their obligation they will be charging ec and also if a producer recycler refurbisher manufacturer are not registered unregistered and they abets to the violation of this regulation they will be charging they will be levied with the ec further the payment of ec they are further clarified and this is something similar in other epr rules as well that the payment of ec is not going to absolve of absolve you of your epr target so let's take an example so let's say you have a target of 2000 tons and you end up doing 1500 tons 500 tons is still your obligation so if i pay the environmental compensation fees for 500 tons it doesn't mean i am i am relieved of my 500 tons target doesn't mean that it means that you have to pay 500 ec for 500 tons but you still have to complete the 500 tons in the coming years and if you do that and let's say in the subsequent year you finish the 500 additional ton then ec charged will be returned up to 85 percent if you do in the year two the ec charge the so 60 percent of the ec will be refunded and if you complete it in year three the 30 percent of ec will be refunded thereafter in the fourth year no ec will be refunded the unfulfilled epr obligation of a particular year can be carried forward to up to three years Further, for recycler, if a recycler gen, uh, over generation of EPR certificate by a recycler due to false information above 5% will attract cancellation of registration and a non refundable EC will be imposed. So, very strong uh, action on the violation for the recycler is also given. And if there is a repeat violation from the recycler, violation of more than three times will result in, will result in permanent revocation of the registration over and above the ec charges the ec charges collected shall be kept in a separate escrow account and shall be utilized in collection and recycling and end of life disposal of uncollected historical orphan and e waste and which the uh, or e waste which the environmental com compensation is levied and it should be invested in research and development also further moving ahead there will be a steering committee which will be formed and the committee will be comp comprising of MOEFCC representative, METI representative, representative from the association of producer and manufacturer of triple equipments, uh, representative of w uh, the recyclers associations, representative from SPCBs and PCCs and a member convener which will be head of concert division of the CPCB. The, the what would be the responsibility of this committee is would be overall implementation and monitoring and supervising of these rules regulations hold the power to remove difficulties decide upon the dispute arising from time to time representation received in this regard and shall also shall refer to mofcc any substantial issue arising pertaining to these regulations review and revise in the view of technology advancement and other factors with the approval of the ministry what what they can review and revise is guidelines epr targets and addition of new equipment in schedule one so they are authorized to add uh, you know they can uh, they can review and revise the guidelines update the guidelines the epr targets or any new equipment which need to be added into the schedule one in the view of the technological advancement modalities and heads for utilization of ec fund would be decided by the committee uh, by the sc with the approval steering committee with the approval of mofcc which may also issue instruction in this regard so now this 
this is the list which we have been speaking about. So the first list, the first page, you can see there are three categories in which the first category, the green highlighted category equipments is the equipment which was already there into the in the e-waste prior 2016 rules. And the remaining which are added in this new draft rule, proposed rule is products or equipments of transmitting sound images and other information by telecommunications. So yes, telecommunication is widely impacted. VTS, all components excluding structure of a tower, tablets, iPads, tablets, scanners, routers, GPS, UPS are also in addition to the category one. In the category two, uh, they were used to be five items. However, now it has increased to 18, which includes screens, radio sets, setup boxes, video cameras, video recorders, hi-fi recorders, audio amplifiers, and hence what? Four. And then there are this for, four categories which is entire new in which large and small electrical and electronic equipment is there in which there are 29 items electric electrical and electronic tools with the exception of large scale stationary industrial tools and then there are toys legion sports equipment medical devices with the exception of all implanted and infected products so yes this is about the uh, summary of the rules Thank you everyone for your time. With this, uh, we will be concluding today's webinar. And I hope uh, this session was really fruitful to everyone. And uh, yes, we will be sharing the PPT with everyone after the webinar. Thank you for your time. Thank you once again.